box and I will um, call on you and then you can ask the question. Um, okay, great. All right, uh, welcome to the second of four public art talks here at the Leslie MFA in Visual Arts June 2020 residency. I'm the director of the program, Ben Sloat. Our general thematic for this residency is social abstraction, which considers a means to process, transform, and artistically respond to social contexts while considering the spectrum of abstraction present within the social fabric itself. Our programs began Sunday with my faculty talk on art, value, and social abstraction uh, with remarks by Jerry Saltz on next days in the art world, and yesterday with a talk by the artist and activist Carrie Moyer. Our programs continue tomorrow with a talk by our visiting faculty, Anthony Romero, and Thursday with the mixed media artists, Aaron, Eric and Mac. I hope those watching the YouTube live stream on the front page of our website can join us for those programs. Um, I wanna mention that our today's speaker, uh, Ursula von Reidingsvarg, uh, a new film about her life called Into Her Own has just been released earlier this month. Uh, this a movie can be rented on Vimeo On Demand through different movie theaters, including uh, the Brattle Theater uh, here in Cambridge. So please check that out. It's a fantastic movie. Um, about our artists today, often working on a monumental scale and hand cut cedar, Ursula von Reidingsvard evocative sculpture suggests various integrations of organic and imagined forms. Haunting and urgent, the works seem to exist within the landscape outside of human impact. Personally, when I've seen Ursula's work uh, in person, a story emerges. These include spotting a range of her works from a distance while on a water bus in Venice in 2015 and seeing her sculptures gain in size as the boat approached. Or at the De Corva Sculpture Park one winter 10 or so years ago and seeing delicate snow flurries highlighting the dark graphite and cedar of her piece titled Ends Pens. Ursula's work uh, can be seen in public installations at Storm King Art Center in New York, at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, Princeton University Art Museum, uh, and right here in Cambridge outside of the MIT campus. Uh, before she begins, and I, and I wanted to share this one quote by um, Giacometti, which I've thought about for many years. And I feel like uh, Ursula's work really embodies in a lot of ways. And you know, as it transforms a lot of elements, which are very challenging, which we're all experiencing in today, uh, into something really powerful. And Giacometti says, anguish, forlornness, the tragedy of life, and the savage determination to resist, to not be beaten, to prevail. Uh, please join me in welcoming Ursula von Reidingsvard. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I have sometimes been asked why I make art. It's not a question I find easy to answer with any kind of clarity, but I will try to poke around some possibilities. Why do I make art? Mostly to survive to ease my high anxiety, to numb myself with the labor and the focus of building my work, to ease uh, <clears throat> my high anxiety, to numb myself with the labor and focus of building my work, sorry. Objects of the process by which I concretize my ideas feels so good because I invariably, especially with my monstrous pieces, run into intense anxiety moments from which I have to unravel myself because there's a pleasure in it, because there's pain in it, because I endure a hefty load of self-doubt, because I have confidence in the possibility of seeing this work through, because I see life as being full of abominations because life is full of marvels close to miracles, because I still don't get who I am, because I will never get who I am, because my deepest admiration goes to those who have made art that has interested me, because I want attention from those who make good art, because I need to use both my body and my mind. The labor of my body is what keeps me awake and alive. 
what numbs me and offers a kind of veneer between me and the things in life which are painful to face. Because the visuals, that which I perceive through my eyes, are an extraordinarily important part of my life. Because I don't want to be doing anything else with my life, that the building of my artwork feels like the most consequential thing I could be doing with my time. Because I can run into a world of my making both physically and mentally because I like working with a group of assistants who become another kind of family. Because I like the daily rhythm of going to my studio, because it's a place to put my pain, my sadness, because there's a constant hope inside of me that this process will heal me, my family and the world. Because it helps fight my inertia because I like embroidering around my long ago Polish fantasies, because I can reach into the future with my work, because I constantly need to try to better understand the immense suffering and pain of my family that I never seem to be able to really understand. And also because I want to get answers to questions for which I know there are no answers. <clears throat> That's it. <laughs> Hi, Joel. Okay, here yeah. we go. The name of this piece is Ojikshen. It's not really Ojikshen. This is very related piece to Ojikshen. This one is Paul II, for Paul II. And it reaches out at the top and it actually needs a wall that is closer to it at the top. Uh, but I love the the tremors that happen at the top. And it comes out as much as about four or five feet. So there are many pieces of cedar that create that top. And it's very turbulent. And when you're below it, it's, it, 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 it comes out so far that you get a little bit of a start. A, you know, a little bit of a scare. Or I, I don't even know whether that's the right word. But as you go down, that there's a more silent way of doing it. Uh, and you can see that the bottom is almost like a ripple. Uh, and I'm sorry you're not seeing this in the flesh uh, because it's very potent and a human being is about halfway up uh, the, the side of, 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 of this piece. And I, I often, in fact, 80% of my pieces are, have Polish names. And the reason for it is that I, I you know, there, <clears throat> Polish, na Polish names in themselves have a way of having endings. You know, you know by the name that, that whether or not it is, is, is it means a female or a male and, and the degree to which you love that person is made very clear in that name. Uh, so, so Ojikshen is the name that that my mother called me when I was very, very young. I, I don't know, two, three, four, five years. And it was a name that was very affectionate. Uh, and obviously all of this is made with cedar. And the cedar is cut with a circular saw. It is not a chainsaw. Everybody has this image of me with a chainsaw. It is not that circular saw is far, far more delicate. 
and it doesn't eat almost, you know, more than a quarter of an inch with whatever cut that it makes. It's not, it's not as crass. It's not as, uh, anyways, uh, the, the, it's, it's a circular saw that, that we use. Now I have people that I, I, you know, that beg me to, 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 uh, to, to use the circular saw on the cedar uh, because that's the most dangerous thing that we do. And I never ask anybody to do it. They have to really want to do it. The next, next one. <clears throat> is anybody there? Yeah, okay. So this is um, Elegantka. That's Polish name again. It's, it refers to a female. <clears throat> and she is in a green garden that is in front of the Philadelphia Museum. Uh, and uh, she is uh, <clears throat> made out of resin. Uh, it's a plastic. But I make the entire thing first out of uh, um, cedar. I cut all of this, the full scale model out of cedar. And, it, and as you see, it has beautiful things that it's, that it's giving to the night. Uh, and, and, it, and it's actually also beautiful during the day because the sun does its own job on, on her surface. So that's uh, Elegantka. It's actually Elegantka too because there's a smaller version of it that really looks different. Uh, next one. This one uh, is made from cedar and you're looking at the cedar itself. Uh, <clears throat> but I will show you a version of this, another version of this <clears throat> and I will tell you when we come to it, because every side of my piece is so different from every other side, and that there is a kind of reach, a want to go up. And the folds are really wonderful. There's so much fun to make. And it's not just the folds that make wave-like structures, <clears throat> but it's but also each four by four and the, the little things that you see that are that that that, that you can pretend pre you don't have to pretend but they're the they're the four four inch by four inch cedar beams that I use. So you know this one must have had I don't know couple thousand uh, of them. And I start at the bottom of the piece. I draw, I draw in, in chalk at the bottom. <clears throat> and then I, it starts growing from there. Uh, and then, and then as you can feel and see that, that they're really related, can you, can you not, okay. that they're really related to one another that there's a relationship between say the bottom one that I put in and then the top one and the left one, the right one. So there, they, 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 you know, there, I, I, I know, I, 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 I have an image in my head when I start these pieces because you have to start somewhere, but they end up being so different in the end they end up being uh, being sort of, I get more and more informed as I go up and up and I build up and I actually screw them down first, all the four by fours, I screw them down first. Then I take them down with each layer. Uh, I take down and, and, and reverse stack it. And then we, glue it and something like this would take about uh, four months to glue because there are a lot of layers and the layer takes an overnight to dry it's resourceful. it's but but it's a it's a it's a glue that's great 
for things that you're going to be putting outside. So anyway, so just just see if you can somehow uh, pretend, you know, or, or just see, keep keep the image of this uh, as as we go on. <clears throat> Next, and this is at Yorkshire Sculpture Park. So this one is at um, <clears throat> at um, the it, it's it. This is in Brooklyn. Uh, and it's it's a piece that 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 I patinaed. It's it's a it's a piece that I first again made in uh, in in and and, and, it, and it's actually um, actually lower. It's not as high as the last one that I showed you, uh, but. Um, but this is uh, a place where many, many, many people come, and there's a uh, a like they're th 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 they're players. Anyway, I named her Ona uh, because the the vast majority of the things that happen in this part, the the the, the right part, as I'm looking at it. Uh, of this uh, huge, huge building. It's like a meteor that landed there. And as you see, they have openings and they sort of light up at night. Uh, but it's a very, it's a place that's, that's, that's really uh, used a lot by many, many people. Uh, and this is, this is actually a piece that is made in, in, in bronze from wood again. Next. Now this is just a little piece, a small one. Uh, and I don't know, it just moves. It just makes many, many lines, but they also, the lines kind of fight with one another. They flirt with one another. Uh, it's not a huge piece, but I like it. It's delicate. It's kind of, you know, has a, a sweetness. And there's a kind of way that you can believe that the top is a little bit different because I burnt the, 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 the inner places of the top of the piece. And it's called conjugation. Next one. This is a piece that's at Storm King. And uh, it is in the middle of an alley of trees that's way below it. And it's in, in the fall, as you can, as you can see. Uh, the two appendages that are touching the ground are made of bronze because I could not use the cedar in a way that's that thin. Uh, if it, if it was if it was cedar, uh, it would it would rot. So I use, so I made the cedar uh, appendages, and then I had them cast in bronze. The rest is all cedar, and uh, you can see how happy she is in that setting because she has the two trees uh, that are also on top of her, uh, and. Uh, She's, uh, she's a beauty. Okay, next. Uh, and I hope that you have the head of this piece uh, that, that's, that, that everybody can see. Uh, okay, uh, so this is Droga and this is, she uh, is, her home now is at the Philadelphia Museum because they, uh, they purchased it, uh, and I'm so happy that she got such a great home. So this is her innards, like you can see her innards falling out of her body, and there are diagonals in her head. The head is the right part on my side, and it, it's, it has Di it has diagonals. You can see that my wood went diagonally 
much more to the right and then it straightens out as it goes to the back. But the beautiful thing is, is what happens with the like wash out in the left part of her body. It's kind of, you know, a disposal of, or, 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 or it might be something that, that, that has to do with, cel with celebrating, you know, her body. Um, but it's a piece that's made out of, two, so much of this is made out of uh, wedges, huge wedges that went from the top of her body to the bottom of her body. And the ones to the right would lean to the right, and then they would straighten up as they went toward the back. Uh, the next one. Okay, this is the one that I showed you. It is not the same thing at all. So I so loved this one. Uh, this one is, is called Ojikshen. Uh, I so loved this one that I had to make another version, but that's very different in terms of its top. But you see the same kind of idea, but the ripples aren't the same at all. And the, there's, there's, there, there, there are kind of openings that are almost like, you know, baby style and they get bigger and bigger. And then they're, they're, there's a kind of destruction of them at the very bottom. And you can see the size that that is just by, the, by the, uh, my assistant to the left. Uh, and it's very dramatic because some, some of the, because all of the openings actually have dark areas that are in different places and they, they sort of point in different ways. And there's, there's something that looks, you know, around their, their, their mouths as though it's fleshy. Uh, so, uh, so, and I also made something akin to huge um, ropes, thick ropes, but you know, they're not ropes. Like any, any, any time I use a word, it's not really that, but, but just, just, for, just for not being able to, to, to say any, any, you know, any, it's very, very hard to use words in describing my work. That's, that's what I meant to say. Uh, but there is a kind of, um, you know, relationship between what happens with the top and works its way into the bottom. Next. Okay, this is the same piece in bronze that you saw in wood, <clears throat> but it's another side of it that you saw in wood. That's the one that was in Poland. That was the first piece that you saw. And this is another side of it. <clears throat> and I decided to put something I call lace. And I hate to use that word. I've never yet worn lace and I'm not crazy about lace. It's not, but, but, but you see in the top a pattern and it's a pattern that, 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 that there's a real relationship. You see, you see there, there are smaller openings at the, bod, at the bottom part of the openings, and then they get, they get so much larger and that they ought to actually have sort of fingers of sorts that they reach up to the sky with. But it's very, um, I, I love having the opportunity to, to, be do, to do something like that because it's, it's uh, it's, 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 it's more welcoming. You know, these things are huge. This one's, I think, 21 feet. It's just huge and it's wide. And, mo and, and a lot of sculptures that, that, that are that are foreboding, you know, are very frightening. And I think that the lace at the top and I think even the folds, the kind of folds that this has, feels, feels very welcoming. Uh, so uh, that's the uh, so I call I call this one uh, the bronze bowl with lace, and this is at the Philadelphia Museum as well. Next, uh, 
I think that might be it. Yes, that's it. I have a number of questions and um, I think I'll, I'll ask them and then we'll invite the audience to ask more questions if that sounds okay. Um, so I, a couple of things that came out of your um, movie, which I found really interesting is, you know, you, you mentioned in the movie that you're, you're working with shapes that you felt were part of a kind of inheritance from your, your Polish ancestry. Um, and that when you were, when you finally went back to Poland later on in your life, you saw a lot of similarities between, you know, how wood was treated and stacked, or how you know wheat was bound. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how you see that kind of, um, you know, psychological inheritance. I was born to parents that were uh, very like farmers that were very poor uh, and and I don't even want to have this inside of me you know but the blood runs whether you want it or not e meaning that 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 there's <clears throat> that that I have to admit that there's something that's a calling for me you know through my parents you know, that, that, that I have to answer. The thing of it is, it's not that I ever think about this when I make the piece, because whatever piece I make, I wanna have the complete freedom of sort of knowing just, not knowing, of, 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 of having the choice of putting that four by four uh, cedar chunk you know, just exactly where I want to put it. Like, I don't, I, I don't want to follow, I don't, I, I've never drawn any, 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 any pictures for my, you know, for making a piece. And I think that being so raw, you know, not knowing for sure what it is that you're doing, but, but struggling to do something that feels meaningful to you uh, that you, that you, it, it, that rawness gives it its life, you know, because you're more alive when you're making it. You're not following somebody, somebody's design or your own design. You're, so, um, tell me your question again. My question was, you know, about the sort of family or cultural inheritance you feel that you have. And I'm also curious, when did this become something that you recognize? Because I feel this is something people are speaking very openly about these days, but um, this is not until very recently that that's, that's been the case. But I, 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 I don't even think one needs to recognize it. I think that, that it's inside of you and, and, and one just, it, and it comes out because it has to come out. But the thing of it is, is, is I just want everybody to know that I don't think about these things, my parents, you know, the, 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 the farmers, and, and they can't read or write, you know? So, it, it, you know, it's like, it's like another, another world, but I, but I don't think about this when I make my work. You know, that my work is, is much more, okay, Ursula, what's gonna be next? Okay, you screwed this one up. Now, what are you gonna do about it? You know, or so, so it's, um, I, I made something like, I don't know, 25 shovels. And I don't know why I make those shovels, but of course, you know, I could tell you probably because this is what, you know, my father and my mother used. But they're shovels that are really like sexy, you know, they play with one another, they're, they're huge, they're, some, some of them are not so huge. So that's shovels and tables were a huge thing. And I think that has to do with my blood too. You know, I made so many tables. I don't know, I can't count them. I think I made like 34 tables. And I make, I, I make all my own furniture because that's the furniture I can live with. Otherwise I have to live with somebody else's design and somebody else's mind. 
but I can live with much more comfort with the pe with everything. I make my bids. I make I make you know my counters. I mean you know everything. So um, so so so, and, and and I think the wood too has. You know, my father was a man that um, was a forester. It's, 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 that's the wrong word. You know, he had to go down and chop trees for, for people. He was like a, I don't, I don't want to go into his, his, his childhood. It was very, very, very tough. But, uh, but he understood wood. And to the day that he uh, was taken to the place where people with Alzheimer's go, uh, he chopped wood and he chopped wood like a master right up until then hmm. and could you tell a little bit about your your process so uh, i'm i'm fascinated how you communicate with the work let it speak back to you and, and let it sort of undergo um its own path so you, you don't design it you just sort of let it happen could you share with our students what that looks like um just to kind of have that unfolding maybe conversation or whatever better word there is with the work i don't know but but you know sometimes it feels wonderful sometimes it feels very confusing and i have burnt pieces of mine you know every other year i burnt a few pieces the ones i can't stand looking at anymore uh and i don't know you it's just the, the, the most important thing is, is that I have, I have the freedom, you know, to do what I need to do. It's like the only thing I need to listen to is something deep inside of me. And I have no idea what it's saying. It's not even using words, but I, but, 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 but the older I get, the more, the, the, the more clarity somehow I can communicate you know, and it's not with words, you know, it's with images. So um, I, 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 I feel like my, my, my studio is a sanctuary, you know, and it's the only place where I can really say things visually that I need to say, that I want to say, um, does that, that, does that yeah. answer your question? No, no, absolutely. It's, it's a really, it's a, it's such a powerful thing to hear an artist be so sort of, um, aware of their own sort of artistic voice like this. And, and that, that level of integrity and, and focus is something we, we really admire. I wondered, um, I have two more questions and I want to open it up to, to other folks because there's a ton of questions that are, are popping up in the chat box. Um, you know, the first one is, you know, right now, uh, because of the pandemic and, and, and these protests and the awareness of, of racial violence and brutality and economic, a lot of people are, are trying to ch change or, or take these feelings and, and transform them uh, into, into work or, or into, you know, something meaningful. Um, and you're very open in, in the movie about discussing your vulnerabilities, your pain, your anger, and how that's become a kind of, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know how you would describe it, but it's really compelled the work or at least, um, you know, given you a motivation to, to kind of put yourself in motion. And could you share, you know, what would you say to a student who was trying to, to do that process for themselves? Well, <clears throat> I've, I've never tried to literally, um, you know, like make, make drawings or make paintings or make things that, that are political. Um, but I think everything is political. You know, I think, I think, you know, but but that that wasn't the question that you were answering. I mean that, that you were asking. Um, I don't know. Tell me tell me again what you want. Well, I guess I'm I'm asking. You're able to sort of take parts of yourself which are, 
you know, we often try to suppress, you know, our feelings of vulnerability and in our pain and our anger. But I think I was really just really stunned. And, and I thought it was such a wonderful model for us to think, how do we deal with those feelings we're feeling now? And how do, how do we, what sort of- It would be so hard to tell people because mm -hmm because I think each person has to do it individually, has to do it in themselves. And, and I think, you know, trusting yourself is a hugely important thing, but I don't even know what it means really to trust yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think not, let's see, that, that, that in my case, in my case, I feel like I wasn't in any kind of a movement you know, so that I didn't have, you know, any obligations to that. But some, sometimes movements really help people. But I have certainly borrowed from movements of, of, of artists. Uh, and I have a lot of artist friends whose work I love, you know, so that that's very helpful. I'd say New York City is, is, is an extraordinary place for an artist to be. And I, I, I feel so happy to have a studio that's the kind of studio I've always wanted all my life. So I've had this studio since two, the year 2000. And I had it, it's in Bushwick, and it's at a time when uh, the uh, immigrants used to walk to, 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 to the shops, uh, to, to the factories. And now it's all artists, but even not even now, but like like five five years later, it was all artists, you know. So so one has to go to a place that's still dangerous, you know, where the women were getting um, having, you know, you you wouldn't get go out of your 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 home your your studio, you know, after dark, you know, all, all of that. But 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 now, but. But, but this is the classic thing that always happens with artists, that they make a library, they make a, 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 a great place to have a drink, they make special kind of clothing stores, they have great, great places to eat. You know, so all of a sudden it gets taken away from the artists because the artists, you know, made it, but they made it so well that, that everybody else wants to move in. Uh, and, and, but, but I'm, I'm getting away from your question, right? That's okay. I'm, I mean, I'm, personally, I'm fascinated that you make this work in Brooklyn because people would imagine that it's, you know, out in the country and it has a sort of feel of nature, but actually you're in the middle of the city, which is pretty yeah. fascinating. Yeah, um, the, the city is so full of bricks and now so full of uh, I, I beams and glass, you know, and that the higher you go, the more you win, you know, with this glass and, you know, that, that it, it's, it's for me, it, it, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously used to it. I've been there. I, I went to Columbia University in 1973 to 76. That was my MFA. And then it was so much more innocent, you know, even though I thought it was very, you know, very on the move, you know, but it was so much different. So, so it's, 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 you can't sleep when you're in New York City. You know what I mean? I don't mean literally sleep. You have to be awake. You have to have your, 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 your plan, you know, of what you're going to do with your life. You have to do that. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I have a great, great studio. So I can't blame the studio for my, you know, for the work that I do that I don't like, you know, so it's, I, I, I feel very, very, very fortunate, very lucky. Uh, I, I have one more question and then maybe we'll do uh, half an hour of audience questions if you don't mind. Uh, so my last question is, you know, I, I, I love how you talk about each piece as a her, as a kind of uh, body. Um, and so I, do, you, do you imagine each um, sculpture as having uh, a different personality or a different history or, or I, I wonder about how you 
sort of imagine the work um, as they move on into the future? Yeah, I'm not even sure that there's any good reason for any of the names that I make up. And I, I almost think that if I had my choice, uh, I wouldn't name them, but then to, to, to have them with, without a title is awful, you know, that's, that's orphaning them. So, um, I, 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 I don't know. I don't it's okay. Know. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, well, thank you, Ursula. Can everyone uh, turn on your mics and, and videos and let's give Ursula a wonderful round of applause. Thank oh, you thank so you. much. All right, um, really wonderful. Okay, so there's a ton of questions in the chat box. Um, one question, the first one I see is by Holly. Can you define like uh, monstrousness? Uh, that's more for an intellectual to do. <laughs> but can I, can I descri describe monstrousness? But I mean, I guess it would be something that that would go against everything you believe and everything that you want. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I see a question from Kristen. Uh, so Kristen, can you un unmute yourself and ask me a question? Kristen Powers. Um, let me just find it in the box. Where did it go? Oh, can everyone uh, mute themselves in the meantime? Thank you. Just so we don't get extra sounds coming in. I guess I guess it went out of the chat, but really the my oh, question was about about yeah. balance and how you. Um, right. So I can what, uh, I can do all well that several things that. like you know do, where how do you perceive balance to be lines. it how then technically how do you deal with balance in your structures because they're all you know top heavy um, and how do you view balance as part of the structures like for other people to see but also with balance within yourself so i'm just curious about okay. this idea of balance no, that do, you play with um... so you're talking about psychological balance and you're talking about physical balance and you're talking about inside me and you're talking about the pieces yeah just i think i like when i look at your pieces i always think about balance maybe I mean, just because they are top heavy and they're small at the bottom, but it's not just about like, how do you balance your pieces? Um, it's, it's the theme you seem to stay with this theme. So it must be, I'm curious what your view on balance is because it seems like an important part of your yeah. piece. You know, I never say to myself, Ursula, what's your view on balance? You know, somehow when I'm starting to build, it does it it does it you know that's a, that that i i'm so used to making sure that the pieces don't flop you know any one side or the other but that's but that's kind of you know an engineering thing but it's not it's it's more for me it's more like an instinctive thing uh but but then but then all we're talking about is the balance of the sculpture uh, which isn't um, what is, isn't really what you wanted to hear. You wanted to hear more like a philosophy about it. Kind of. I mean, obviously, you must have to balance them. Maybe that's why they're on a high pedestal. Are they balance? You know, like technically, how do you balance your pieces? I am curious about that. The, the ones that are um, the, the ones that are in bronze, we get an engineer and it goes underground and it goes sinks into a cement huge cement uh, thing but but i mean but that's but i think you were talking about something that was almost more philosophical yeah i think so i mean that was the there were two parts technically how do you do it and philosophically what makes you work with balance uh, in your in almost every piece yeah, I would um, 
even the piece in the museum that was top heavy on top and you talked about the wall having to be closer to right right but 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 i never i never when i think of my piece i never say well i i want this piece to have this kind of balance it just happens in the process of my of my like like and I, and i don't have any philosophies about how you know what balance should be or what what anything should be in my work you know i want to sort of clear my head of any words even i mean not that not i, I don't even need to clear my head i don't have you know except the only words i use is sometimes you know oh shit, this didn't work you know what i mean or 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 or, or, or ursula a little more this way come on you know so it's it's uh it's uh, it's not at all academic. It's not at all. The words really don't help me. It's something else. It's the visuals. What about emotionally? Emotionally, yeah. that plays a huge, huge role. Very good. Can you talk yeah, more I'm about still, that? I'm just getting that feeling. Uh, I have to feel. I I I have to allow that to to function and i can do that by being in a place that's safe and by being in a place where nobody's going to say anything about what you do or why you do it and my 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 people know that and they've never done it they just automatically know it where i can really focus like i never listen to music i i i, I can really focus and I love the sign, the sound of the um, the um, circular saws. And I, if if I were to have a burial, that would be my song. You know? <laughs> and I would hear my guys, and I would wave to them before I flopped in. Wow. <clears throat> That's great. Um, yeah, I. I um, before we have another couple, a lot of questions, but uh, I sent you that other uh, quote by Giacometti um, and we don't have to address it, but I, I thought it was really relevant in hearing that you work in silence. Well, this, the sound of uh, but no music. Uh, the other quote by Giacometti I wanna share with the community is, I was suddenly aware of depth, that we're all swimming in depth, but don't notice it because, because we are used to it. Depth transformed people's trees and objects. There was an, an extraordinary and almost agonizing silence for the feeling of depth engenders silence, drowns objects in silence. This is depth, you're saying, yeah, not depth. Depth. Yeah, depth. Right. Yeah. right, right. Um, and we talked a little bit before we started to talk about how your, your work almost exudes this powerful silence. Um, but in any event, uh, I want to let the students ask the questions. Uh, so uh, I have Kelly and then Mackenzie. So Kelly Lair, can you um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, hi. Um, so I was just curious about your process. You talked about not sketching beforehand and just really reacting to your materials. Did you, did you change your process um, over the past or has it always been that way? Always been that way. I hate even reading menus, you know, because that gives you directions. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't like it. Uh, and, and I don't think giving words to my artwork helps me at all. You know, I, I uh, but, but I, but I think I think there are other ways that 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 and and, and I think that I, I actually told them to the last person, you know, that 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 be in a safe place where nobody's gonna interfere with what you're doing. And often my safe place is with two people that do the cutting and the one woman who's right near me that can give me the things so that I can put them where they belong. But I make on all four sides of the cedar, I, I draw the exact thing that the cutters need to cut. 
and I myself cut for about 45 years. So I know exactly what they can do. And we have gone so crazy sometimes. You know, we, I, I, it's, it's like many, many different, uh, many, many, many different things can be done. And I still do things that are, that are, that are things that the, that the cedar never thought it could do. So, um, and I keep trying to get rid of the cedar. I said, enough, you know, when I have another truckload that comes from, uh, from C Canada, the Western part of Canada, that, that it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not even healthy for me to have it. I have these big, big things over my head. Did you see the film? I haven't yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll see that. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 keep, I keep wanting that, but in the end, I think that this is where my best work comes from, is using the cedar. The cedar is, you know, soft. And it's, you know, it enables us to make these surfaces that are so complex, so. Right. Um, next question is from Mackenzie. Uh, Mackenzie, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, um, I have another question about your process. I'm really interested in it as well. Um, ben was actually asking about this earlier the way that you talk about your work and also the way that you talk about how you make your work kind of gives me the impression that you um, are almost work having a conversation with this other entity that none of us know exists yet, mm -hmm. but is real and you're just kind of bringing it into existence so the rest of us can can see it. Um, so I'm wondering if you think of your, your art in that way. Um, for example, specifically the bronze bowl with lace. Mm -hmm. I looked at it and my first impression was, oh, it's a, it's a tree with the common mycorrhizal network of fungus showing. She, usually they don't show that, but she showed it. And then you talked about your decisions behind um, choosing that pattern because of the way that it made you feel. So um, my mind is going in a million it's directions. Bronze bowl with lace. This is bronze bowl with lace that you're describing. And what yes. did you think about it when you saw it? Um, I mean, the last part. Yeah, I there's a underground network that connects trees together um, starting at their roots and it's a network of fun fungus and it looked exactly like a like an underground uh, my background is in biology so I'm thinking like of, one of those trees it looked exactly like one of those trees <laughs> it did yeah and the way that you described um, how you felt you needed to put those on there and um, you said it was very feels welcoming Yes. So I just thought it was so interesting. <laughs> In my interpretation, um, it literally is welcoming and it does invite things together. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so you want me to answer? I don't think, I think you probably answered your own question. <laughs> no, you answered it very well. And I like the, the, the idea of actually trees are able to, in a sense, walk. I mean, it would take them a long, long time and they're able to communicate with one another. If some sort of uh, insect comes, that's gonna, be, that's gonna be eating them or that's gonna be harmful to them, uh, that they can speak with one another. It's a, their own version of speaking. It's their own version of walking. But it's amazing, you know. Books have now been written on 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 what they can do. Yes, yeah. I feel like you were having a telepathic conversation with <laughs> nature. 
Uh, Kim McKenzie. I guess you're talking about like mycelial networks, because I think there's like this wonderful movie about that that just came out, like mm -hmm. on fungi. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Fantastic fungi. Uh, so a few more questions, Ursula. Uh, I know you're probably dying to go back into the studio, so <laughs> we'll just do a few more questions. Uh, uh, Tara uh, Tamarabuchi, can you ask your question? Okay, I had a, I had a few questions. Um, one was about uh, the wood. What does it look like? And you mentioned it's uh, it's cedar, but I was wondering, is it like huge pieces of uncut lumber, lumber or what sizes are you working it's from? Definitely cut, and they cut it exactly <clears throat> the measurement that we needed. And it's not a four by four, but it's very close to a four by four, because when we glue, we need to get a level you know, surface so that we can glue more on top of that level surface. And we do a lot of planing to make them level. So they have exactly the, 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 the people that, that cut it for us know how, how, how thick I need it. But it's basically uh, four by four inches, four by four inches, and it's, they're huge. They're sometimes 17 feet, they're sometimes 10 feet, they're sometimes 24 feet. So we, uh, we, we, yeah, we cut it and to cut it is like, like butter, you know, that's why they can dance with that circular saw. They can, you know, make love with it. They can, you, you know, these, so, so my, my, my cutters, I call them the princes of my studio, and they are, you know, they're, they're the bravest and, and, uh, and often very good looking. So <laughs> it's, it's um, yeah, it's just a wonderful find. And the, and the way I got it, I, I got it uh, at, at Columbia University because I was doing only metal and metal was so hard, you know, you can't really move it. And you, you know, the, it, it just, it just was, hard, you know, very, very difficult two years for me. And at the very end of the two years, there's a guy by the name of Michael Mulhern, who was a monk, and he was one of the students. And uh, we were very good buddies. And he got me a whole lot of four by four seer beams. And I started cutting it with a circular saw in the metal uh, metal uh, room, you know, where, where they only use metal. They didn't have a wood room. Uh, so I, I, I started, you know, I, I lean over <clears throat> uh, and started cutting with it. And it was so, it felt so great, you know, it felt so great. So that's where the marriage started. Wow. I'm wondering about the princes that you spoke of. How do you, it sounds like you have this sort of family in your studio. And I was wondering about how do you orchestrate a group of these makers and work with them and then have your voice come through? Uh, they don't need my voice. I, I just draw for them exactly what they need to cut and they know, they know what, 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 what to do. Uh, and <clears throat> and uh, there, you know, we're we're tremendously concerned about safety, you know. And this one is really so for the cutters. They can take breaks anytime they want. They can, you know. So um, so I'm. And, and, and I'm lucky to have people, one of my cutters was with me, with me for 22 years. He's still with me. And then the guy that does the um, gluing was with me for 26 years. And then I have some more people that were with me. It's, it's, we have so much trust with one another. And when I had my show in England, I took them all to, and it's not many, it's like five people. You know, it's not because I'm I'm so fanatic about controlling everything that's visual, everything. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Andrew. Hello, Ursula. I just wanted to extend my thanks to you for being here. Um, as a first-generation Polish-American, I really oh. uh, 
appreciate your voice. Um, but I also wanted to say that I appreciate and am very interested in the spaces where your work rests, um, specifically places that have overhangs that act as um, systems of protection in a way. And I love that during your talk, you mentioned, you know, the overhang of the Barclays Center sort of protecting that piece as well as the two trees that were framing the other. Um, and I also, it also made me relate to the first piece that you showed in your presentation that extends up, you said about four or five feet and sort of acts again as a system of protection for the people standing underneath the piece. Um, so I'm finding all of these really interesting um, correlations between how you care for the work and how you expect the work to care for us. Um, but my question is, um, your piece entitled Droga, which, which for those who don't know means road, if I'm not mistaken, um, I'm, I'm interested in why you decided to title um, a form that you consider a, a female body um, the word road and what that means for you. Well, <clears throat> it's Droga, D-R-A-G-A. -A. Ah. Is beloved or, you know, yes, to, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm not in love with roads, okay. but, 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 but this was good. Um, so what was your question about droga? Well, I, I was assuming that the translation that it was droga is in a road, but you mentioned that it's, that it's a love. So that makes more sense now. I was just trying to find the correlation between how or why you would consider a body as a, as a, as a road, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you saw it as a body too. Yes, I yeah. did. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's this sort of unraveling that occurs at the end that yeah. I find sort of um, beautiful and, in a way, very grotesque and yeah. magical. Yes. So, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So thank you. Well, thank you. What's your last name? Mrocek. Mrocek. <laughs> nice. Beautiful. It's confusing for American for Americans, but it, it's it's um, beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Um, actually, coming off of Andrew's question, I the last show I saw of yours at uh, Gallery Le Long, because I've seen maybe three of them. Yes. Really had that tension between the work being really uh, seductive but very dangerous, mm -hmm. and, I, and I wondered if you could talk about that that sort of complexity because it's not something we see that often in art that we're so drawn it's so seduced by it but yet it feels like it could kill us yeah i mean that's so observant of you uh i have you know i i you don't want to make sweet work you know you don't want to make work that can be gotten like right away you want to make work that 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 interest you see the first thing is it has to interest me it has to it's it's a very very selfish pro process um that let's see what 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 don't, why don't you repeat a little bit of what you said i guess i'm curious about that relationship between the work being seductive yet incredibly dangerous and yeah yeah and, and and the one thing is vulnerability the vulnerability is so important and the vulnerability leaves you a huge amount of space to work from you know because the vulnerable vulnerability does not have a right or wrong that's 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 as 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 prevalent as we understand those words to be but vulnerability can 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 have you know a really wide stretch and i know that 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 some people think of it as being more weak you know but i think of of it of, of being stronger that it gives you many more options <clears throat> So I think that that's one of the things that I dip into. I don't, you know, I don't even know how to say it. You know, I did, when I make my work is, is to draw out the vulnerability in me. Great. That's a uh, good question. Yeah, uh, we have two more questions. Uh, one is I'll ask for the student who asked, uh, you mentioned some artists that you admire uh, in New York. Could you share who have been 
sort of um, artists you've looked at over the years and, and felt connection with? Well, <clears throat> instead of that, I'm going to tell you uh, that to, my, to uh, the school that I went to, uh, this is um, uh, Philip Guston came. And Philip Guston spoke only to about seven of us. Uh, and, and he said, said, he, he, he was at, at the point when he was, he started to make the harsher things because he had the very sort of beautiful orangish, reddish, pinkish, you know, things that he painted that were very sweet that were very like like tame and so 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 gorgeous to look at and and he started doing the things that were you know much more you know harsh and 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 and, and, and this is the work that he's most known for obviously right now but he was in in, in a change and all of the critics were, were were speaking to him in a way as though he was crazy you know, because they were missing the other things. It was so opposite to what he was doing, you know, that it annihilated that for them. That's that's what they liked. They weren't. They couldn't get used to this this new way that was so rough, that was so rugged, that was so true, that was so vulnerable, that was so harsh. And uh, and and he's he's shaking. You know, and, 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 and for me to have seen his vulnerability at that time, for him to have been that honest, for him to have dug in that deeply and let us know. And he did that on purpose. I mean, be, be, because he wouldn't do that to every, every, uh, every, uh, everybody. We were students. We were students, you know, that wanted to know more so that he he dug more deeply into himself to give and and i am so 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 grateful and one and, and he said he looked at giotto in italy uh and he saw on one of the uh, uh one of the columns mary you know and he said that he could look at mary just for a very short time and he had to turn his head because it was so emotionally moving, you know, and then he would look again, you know, at, at Mary's face. It was, it was, he, he was the best speaker I've ever heard. Wow. And it was all true, you know, coming from him. It's mm. amazing. Um, yeah, the same time that your show was in Venice, there was a show of his at the Gallery de, de Academy in Venice as well. That was just oh a total, total knockout. Oh. Yeah, and, and they showed um, his self-portrait had gone from being very academic to being this whole other thing. Or the, the progression was great. I'll, I'll send you some of the photos I, I shot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have one last question from um, Ian Sexton. Um, you can ask the last question of today. Hi, so thank you so much for this. Um, I was just sort of curious how you find the tension of um, building in layers and also removing from these sort of small pixelated wood objects, right? You have these little four by fours and you're building these large pieces. And, and how do you feel about whether maybe you're leading that process or you're following that process or how do you relate to the, the sort of tension between the subtractive and the additive processes? I mean, I don't know. There's there's a kind of rationale, but I can't even verbalize it. I just take a look at it and I see what it needs and I give it what it needs. And um, often, I the with a, with a with a piece that I was working on previously, I couldn't put this in 
that I'm being I'm putting in the the one that I'm working on now, I couldn't put that in because it would get, it would really derail it, you know. So then you know I I, I sort of try try this one and uh, and and, uh, and and sometimes derailing it is the best thing you could do, you know, is the best thing for it, but you don't know until you do it. So I, all my judgments lay not with what I should do, because I don't even know what I should do, but, 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 but what, I, what, what, what I need to do, what me, I need to do. And you should never, never think of anybody else, pleasing anybody else, because it's all you can do to sort of figure out for yourself what you want, what you need, you know, so you don't worry about anybody that does, you know, uh, uh, that, that writes about your work or that, or that, you know, because it just, you, you don't need any more complications. It's only you and this thing that you're working on. And, and I don't know, and, and don't wait for any bird to come and talk to you in the ear, you know, give you inspiration, because the making of it, that's, well, at, at least that's true for me, the making of the piece is what will tell you most clearly what, where it should go. That's wonderful. But you do have to, before you start working, you do have to have to have some idea of what you want. Well, Ursula, this has been so phenomenal and generous and we're in such appreciation for you. This has really been incredibly meaningful. I think a lot of us are feeling um, a lot of weight on us from the world. And, and this has been so kind of, uh, you know, activating and energizing. So thank you. Can, every all, can we all uh, unmute ourselves and give Ursula a wonderful round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, well, have a, a wonderful rest of your day, Ursula. And uh, to all the uh, folks in our program, we'll see you uh, for our crits at two and then at five for our program meetings. They're good. Thank you again. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. I so enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye now.